So in that sense, I want to democratize the, 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 the story of innovation. I'm, I want to make it clear that anyone can do it. The basic question that a writer asks, I think, is what should I write about? And um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it, that's the biggest question. You know, there's no help for you either. Uh, and it's, it's a total mystery. But what is common throughout history, throughout time, is that when you have that upstairs, downstairs thing, there's a certain amount of that that you can maintain if you're on top through hard power and hard system. We're absolutely delighted to be back here with our edition, albeit digitally, of JLF Houston. There are so many wonderful authors and speakers who you will hear over the next few days. And I hope they will power your imagination as they have ours to look into the future, into a brighter tomorrow. On behalf of Namata Gokhale, William Dalrymple, Sanjoy Roy, and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, Asia Society, and Imprint, we welcome you to the keynote session of JLF Houston 2021 Virtual Festival. Presenting Shutdown, How COVID Shook the World's Economy, Adam Tooze in conversation with Shruti Rajagopalan. Adam Tooze's latest book, Shutdown, How COVID Shook the World's Economy, is a staggering and incisive take on the interplay of globalization, world politics, economy, and climate change. Masterfully unraveling the fragility of the world order, the cogent narrative weaves through finance, business, and the global human experience to make it clear that the crisis unleashed well before the virus. In conversation today with Shruti Rajagopalan, Tooze gives us a panoramic view of the continued impact of 2020 and the deeply rooted ruptures in our way of being. Adam Tooze is a professor of history at Columbia University and the author of Crashed, winner of the Lionel Gelber Prize, a New York Times notable book of 2018 and one of Economist's Books of the Year and a New York Times Critics' Top Book. He's also the co-host of Foreign Policy's forthcoming podcast, Ones and Twos, which debuted in September 2021. Shruti Raja Gopalan is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and a fellow at the Classical Liberal University at NYU School of Law. She's the host of the Ideas of India podcast. She directs the Emergent Ventures India Grants Program at the Mercatus Center. Her broad area of interest is the economic analysis of comparative legal and political systems. Her research interests specifically include law and economics, public choice theory, and constitutional e economics. Please do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. In these difficult times, we've struggled to bring you JLF Houston 2021 without charging a registration fee. Please support us as generously as you possibly can to ensure a free, seamless, and continuous flow of knowledge. Simply click on the support GLF option button on the right hand side of your screen. Your contribution is greatly appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, it's our pleasure to present Shut Down, How COVID Shook the World's econo Economy. Adam Tooze in conversation with Shruti Rajagopal. Over to you, Shruti. Thank you so much. Uh, and this is such a pleasure. Uh, hi, Adam. It, it's hi. great to have you. And hello to everybody at Houston who, who are live streaming to this event. Uh, we are going to be discussing uh, this book, uh, the latest book that Adam has written, uh, which is sort of chronicling the history we've been living through collectively uh, for the last, uh, you know, 20, 22 months, depending on where you are uh, in the world. So Adam, it's a pleasure to have you here. So great to be here with you. So you've talked about uh, the disproportionate impact of the virus on different age groups uh, uh, medically and also on the different policy choices affecting these different age cohorts. And uh, 
collectively, you know, across the world, we have systematically chosen shutdown policies that protect the elderly. And in the process, we have traded off education, uh, you know, for school going children and jobs for the working age population. Uh, and of course, you know, the loss of education has long run effects. This is really well documented. Uh, there's a massive amount of economic stimulus that has been put in place to make up for the loss of jobs and economic activity. But once again, it seems like the younger generation one day will be left with the bill in the future. Uh, given what's happened during the pandemic, do you think it is time to rethink democratic politics, something radical like lowering the voting age or maybe capping the voting age or maybe thinking of systems of, you know, weighted voting of younger cohorts uh, or something like that? I'm very sympathetic to that proposition in general because this is not just an issue that concerns um, the, the pandemic but, but concerns, say, the climate politics of the current moment. And in general, it's, it must be unhealthy in societies which in the West are ageing as rapidly as they are, that we have such a heavy and disproportionate representation of the opinions and interests of people whose life expectancy is shorter systematically than, than uh, the younger folks. And, and so in general, I would be in favour of lowering the voting age for sure. There have been discussions, quite serious discussions in countries like Europe and Germany to even consider like, you know, family weighted voting, um, which would be a rather different model of the same thing. Uh, when they faced an impasse over family policy, it uh, became very difficult there to get general support for, say, uh, early childhood education, pre-K. Um, and so then you can find yourself in a, in a, in a vicious circle. It's also, I would not deny for a second, um, the differential impact of the measures that were chosen um, with which to address the, the crisis. It's, it's undeniable, it's real. I'm, I'm the middle-aged parent of a kid who, who is, you know, had her two of her four years at college uh, massively disrupted by the policies that we've chosen to adopt, in part to protect, you know, wrinkly, older, grey-haired professors like myself, plus the immediate surroundings and and you feel bad about that I, I i i take it extremely seriously i've seen the damage that it's done it's much easier i think for people in mid-career with established identities to hibernate for a couple of years um it's not really any great hardship for me to retreat to the comfortable office that you can see in the background here that literally used to be my daughter's bedroom and that was converted into this office so that i could get through the crisis as well as i have for her, of course, <laughs> these are this is a period in which identities are shaped, in which you have to decide your future. And so interrupting that is far, far more impactful and traumatic than it is for those of us who already have established identities. And globally, and the World Bank has done estimates of this, the losses in human capital, and one can think various thoughts about the human capital concept. It's not in any way an uncontroversial idea, but it's an economist's best effort to capture what are historically unprecedented losses? I mean, never before, I think probably in the history of humanity, have we interrupted the formation and education of young people on such a comprehensive scale. On the one hand, it's a kind of convulsive anthropological uh, uh, experience. Every young person the world over will be able to bitch and moan about how horrible it was to be cooped up with their parents but forever after. They'll all have that generational experience, but more seriously, there's no doubt at all that this is a huge loss. And unless countermeasures are taken of the long-term variety, not just the sugar high of immediate stimulus, but long-term, as it were, compensatory effects, particularly in low-income and middle-income countries, the effects are going to be damaging. But even in rich countries, we know it's been hugely socially selective as well. Again, people in better off, more stable circumstances, um, with good Wi-Fi connections got through this okay. On the other hand, people in much more yeah. precarious situations didn't. And that isn't even to speak of the dimension of, say, gendered violence and the yeah. way in which the public sphere prefer offers women on the whole a protection at, at times from the violence they encounter in the domestic space and children as well. But having said all of that, and you can see the extent of my sympathy, I think if we look at what was going on in the spring, I don't think the calculation was quite that calculation. I mean, A, we didn't really understand this virus very well. Um, so we, we weren't, it was, it was an emerging knowledge 
that this was really a threat only to the elderly and the people with preconditions. We all remember the way in which that data emerged. We didn't really understand about how difficult it was to pass the first variants on outside in the public sphere. We were, we were, we were navigating in the dark. We didn't have the promise of the vaccine in the not too distant future, which would have made some sort of isolate, protect strategy viable. You know, you could have just, as it were, locked down those who needed to be locked down for 12 months. And then we didn't know that that was going to be the timeline. We didn't know that by the spring of 2021, those most vulnerable would be able to be protected. And the other crucial thing that we mustn't underestimate is that this in the end, after all, was not just about individuals, it was about social systems. And the thing that needed protecting was not just individual old people and their, and their risk of death, but the stability of the hospital system. That was the alpha and omega, the, the thing that mattered, right? And the big worry was that if the hospital system was burdened by a huge wave of patients of whatever demographic profile, age range or whatever else, it would swamp the hospital system. And then car accident victims, expecting mothers, cancer patients would not be able to access care. And we would see a huge spike in mortality driven by that of all age groups. So the, the choice was not as crisp as, as it were, the trade-off of one generation against the other. It was protect the system, protect the infrastructure. Now, so much so that in countries like Britain and Sweden, um, old people were dumped out of the hospital system into the care system without adequate testing, which then resulted in huge mortality in care homes. Because in the end, it wasn't even protecting the old people that there was priority. It was protecting the hospitals that was, right? Save the NHS became this mantra in Britain at all costs. So. So I agree, in, you know, your general point, do young people right now get a rough deal and are intergenerational equity issues skewed and screwed up? And do we need a new political infrastructure to change that? Yes, 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 yes. Did this in particular uh, hurt younger people? Absolutely. But I think if we're thinking about the broader logic of the pandemic response, we have to reckon with a wider range of factors. Uh, I, I'm very sympathetic your, to your point of view. I would disagree on, on a small margin, though, which is, you know, the shutdown is, is two parts, right? It's a policy choice at a point in time for any country or state that we're talking about, say, last year in March or April or when the Delta va variant started surging. But it's also an everyday choice for institutions at a lower level? Do we keep schools open? Do we not keep schools open, right? Are we are we allowing children in parks or are we keep keeping parks and beaches closed and so on and so forth? So I agree with you on the original choice of the lo lockdown very much. At that time, you know, I mean, we were seeing news coming from places like Bergamo and, you know, you're seeing 20, 30 pages of obituaries in the newspaper and it's terrifying and you don't know what to do other than to shut down in a sense, right? But it seems like the, the, the prolonged everyday choice in the last, say, 12 to 14 months mm -hmm. since the original choice, uh, in my opinion, has not appropriately done the cost benefit analysis where all the costs and benefits of one group are disproportionately represented and the costs of children, including having fun and having a good time and going mm -hmm. to the beach and, of course, getting an education, which has impact on, on longer life, uh, but, you know, longer life decisions. Uh, I think that is where, you know, I as a society, we seem to have yeah. kind of missed our uh, our mark. And I think I think this is a this. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I think this is a fascinating and very legitimate set of questions. Um, I think it's largely a set of questions really for 2021. Yes. Uh, yes. And the book really deals with that yes. initial shock, the ramifications Absolutely. through the global economy of that initial shock, and then the set of choices that had to be made. But in honest, in all honesty, like my, you know, the latter chapters of the book don't deal in detail with the yes. second wave of shutdowns. But I think given given the intensity of those and the mortality they generated both in Europe and the United States and also of course in India ultimately, you, you can see how serious those choices were as well. By the time we get to 2021 with the availability of the vaccine, I think we may agree that in a sense there's an abundance of caution operating here and particular yeah. interest groups that are, as it were, using the, the general state of concern 
um, for other for other interests, which may or may not be Absolutely. legitimate, but are, as it were, m making the cost benefit analysis here foggy. In 2020, I, I think, and which is what the book really focuses on, yes. in that first phase, I do think the logic was very driving, and that that's what does the economic damage, right? The the, yeah. the huge shock to global GDP, the huge shock to the Indian labour market, the huge shock to the Chinese yeah. labour market, which we shouldn't underestimate. Though the regime does a very good job of like you know keeping it below the headlines. Yeah. The crisis in European public finance, the debates about American, they're they're all about American stimulus. They're all triggered by that first shock, and as we know, even if one could agree that, as it were, the later phases of lockdown and shutdown have been limiting and in various ways certainly hamper uh, the free enjoyment of you know life by, by young people, their economic effect has been much, much more modest. So we've gotten a lot smarter about how we do um, shutdowns, lockdowns over the course of this experience. So now, though we operate in various ways under a constrained regime, GDP has come a very long way back in many countries. There's in fact a sort of mystery as to, in the American case, how GDP could be as high as it is and labour market participation be as low as it is, because it's almost as though we've experienced a huge productivity shock, which positive shock, which, which doesn't really ring all that true. So yeah. there are, some, there are some, some complicated stories there, but the book, as I say, um, is really all about that, that, that unprecedented, sudden, dramatic, move in the spring and how then the effects ripple through politics, geopolitics, economic policy choices. Another book will have to be written about how we dealt with, well, fingers crossed, right? I mean, we're yeah. having this conversation under the premise that Delta is it, the vaccine suite that we've got right now is all we really need, you know, and at some point we'll get our act together to the point where we can roll out the vaccines globally. That's the upside scenario and to my mind we're still riding our luck on this because there are obviously a whole bunch of much grimmer scenarios in which this is really just the prelude to another wave of the pandemic that could be even worse than the first one. So you know uh, touching upon the initial uh, shutdown uh, logic right this is essentially the idea of flattening the curve. Yeah. Uh, we need to protect the public health infrastructure because if it collapses, it's not available to anybody for any kind of problem, you know, as, even aside from the pandemic. And so, but I still think this, the concern was different in developed versus developing countries and also played out differently. So in developed countries, the concern is really, let's not overwhelm the existing medical infrastructure, right? And ensure the best possible care. And we can do that by staggering who gets the infection when within a given population. Uh, and for the most part, it worked out well, other than some spikes where in certain places like say New York City or certain parts of Europe, uh, you saw the hospital infrastructure under tremendous stress largely, you know, it came in uh, well within capacity, right? Mm -hmm. um, for various reasons, uh, especially given that the rest of the world had shut down and you have fewer car accidents and you, you know, other things, yeah. you have fewer elective surgeries and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, in developing countries, the problem seems to be quite different. The shutdown choice, especially in places like India, it's really no choice at all. There isn't much of a uh, healthcare infrastructure even to protect, right? And if that minor healthcare infrastructure collapses, then of course it'll be calamitous, but really it's, it's no choice because you don't have the infrastructure that is required in fact to allow for economic activity to continue as usual to deal with the pandemic. And, and this seems to be another sort of, you know, line of inequality between, uh, say, Western countries, North America, Australia, and large parts of South Asia uh, and, and Africa. Yeah, I, I'd say there's three. I think this is a, a very interesting set of questions. I think I think this, it's worth making, as it were, three distinct observations about this. The first is that in the pre, you know, in calculations done by economists and health economists about the likely impact of a global pandemic before 2020, one of the assumptions was that it would strike a low income and medium income countries first. So if you look at the paper that Larry Summers did, I think in 2018 or 2019, this was the assumption. And the result of that is that, as it were, the GDP effects are rather small because 
in the cynical mode of this kind of calculation, the loss to GDP of a loss of life or a loss of a worker in countries with lower productivity is proportionally smaller. Whereas, and also I think we have to factor in that obviously in large parts of the world, the so-called epi epidemiological transition is incomplete at best or just simply non-existent. Large parts of the world are not particularly freaked out by the fact that people get infectious diseases and sometimes die of them. In fact, in some cases, die of them in large numbers, right? Whereas this peculiarity of this pandemic was that it hit in sequence China, Europe, and the United States, which are at the same time, all of them societies which are profoundly invested in the idea and institutionally organized around the idea that they've completed the epidemiological transition. This is true just as much for China as it is for the United States. The, one of the promises that regime makes is that they're no longer the old China, so you're not going to die of a nasty infectious disease in modern China. And of course, they're also 60% of global GDP, right? So that's kind of the shock. That it then subsequently ramifies through the emerging market and low income world is in a sense, you know, it's like a very bad case of the flu or something, right? But the fact that this thing that broke through the security shield um, of infectious disease in those, it, and it broke through in those three places, it broke through comprehensively and it, it therefore puts in jeopardy 60% of global GDP. Then I think, for my mind, what's really surprising about March and April is how, in a sense, regardless of the trade offs, Regardless of any calculation, like the one that you've just offered, practically all governments around the world feel compelled to act and to follow essentially a certain sort of template, originally set by the Chinese, but I don't think anyone paid attention to the Chinese. They're really modeling themselves on some version of what the Europeans and the Americans yeah. are doing. And it becomes hugely compelling. You know, and you see that at the state level in India first and then at the central government level, but you see it everywhere, right? The, the only exceptions to this are places like Tanzania and Belarus, where you, where you have regimes that are just invoking some other source of authority, right? The memory of Stalinism or God in the case of Tanzania. Everywhere else is basically just saying, right, okay, the global norm is good governance suggests that we should do some sort of a lockdown now. There is, of course, also, as you say, the pragmatic calculation that were it to get bad, it would overwhelm our fragile health system. I think that's South Africa is a really, really telling case of that. In India, it's not obvious to me that the caseload was strong enough, really, by the end of March to warrant like a, a specific fear of that type. But there is absolutely a sense that India can't be seen to not act on this. It's a global imperative. And then the third, the, the third element kicks in here, which is where, you know, where we, I'm sure, wholeheartedly agree, which is how long can you sustain this lockdown for? Yeah. And then, and what do you need to do to sustain it? And, and you see there, as you say, this is where the huge gulf opens up between the advanced economies which can afford really large scale transfer programs, the level of poverty in the United States went down in 2020. I mean, the contrast to India could hardly be more extreme, right? Um, it went down because they discovered that if you just print checks and hand them, you know, large checks, if you send people in West Virginia 60 or $70,000, they will be better off than they are normally, right? So it's, it's a, it's a, and at the other end of the scale, poor, low income, middle in, low, low middle income countries with huge informal labor markets in big cities, India would be one case, but even much more acute, I think, in some ways is, is Lima, Peru, where we have, yes. you know, a massive outbreak and a huge informal labor market in a city of 10 million people. Um, so that then becomes, I think, the crucial dividing path. Right. And for certain societies like Europe, they can contemplate doing shut down after shut down after shut down if they have to, if it's dictated. Right. They can afford it. They've actually, and, and furthermore, the Europeans have a labor market policy infrastructure that means they can do short time working. So they've effectively abolished unemployment in Europe now. You don't, there's no reason why anyone should ever see a spike in European unemployment rates again, because they figured out a way basically of absorbing a big part of the, of the wage bill onto the government account. It's way cheaper, it turns out, than the other solutions. It has all sorts of moral hazard, you know, unimaginable kind of problems from a government's point of view. But it's, it's, it's really, it's a very radical move, I think, very underestimated in the development of the welfare state. You, you can't do that in the US because we don't even have an effective unemployment insurance system here, but it is a rich enough country to do big stimulus. Whereas if you're South Africa or Nigeria or, uh, or India for that matter, 
this is really just not a within the option set, right? You can't out, you cannot in a prolonged way sustain the unemployment rates that India had by May, June, which, you know, according to the best estimates I've seen are pushing 25%. You know, they're blips, these are migrant workers, informal migrant yeah. workers. So these are hazardous estimates, but that's, I mean, it's, it's the largest, it, India and China suffer the largest single labor market crisis in human history in that in that period we've never seen so many people rendered breadless and unemployed before at, at such a pace and you can't do that you there's not an experiment you can repeat under any circumstances so yes it's it's hugely divisive with regard to economic capacity with regard to the decision situation with regard to institutional structures that enable you to handle this now as you mentioned, hopefully this is the end of it, right? And we've been saying this for a while with each wave that's coming, but hopefully this really is the end of it. Uh, we're seeing that vaccinations are working. Uh, lots of countries, more and more low-income countries are now getting access to it. We still need to figure out a delivery mechanism in many parts of the world, but the supplies now exist, right? And there's a solution in sight in some sense. Uh, that is an Indian perspective, I think. And you have a powerful national, the most powerful, and just in terms of productive capacity yes. in the world with the Serum Institute, right? The, but this is, this is not the story for sub-Saharan Africa, right? So yes, they, where... they, are, like, they are just flying on, on good luck, right? They, they, the very, very low rollout rate, no domestic production capacity to speak of. There's the time horizon for immunization there stretches realistically to 2023. So we just yeah. need we just hope and pray there's no new variant. Yes, no, I, I think that concern is very real. But what I mean is uh, maybe even eight months ago, if we were having this conversation, there was a huge question of will the world even have enough vaccines, oh, yeah, right? And now in some sense, that supply problem. So, you know, first was the technical solution. So now a vaccine exists. And now there's a question of can, can we get enough of it? And I think the last mile is always the hardest. We've seen this over and over again in every developing country, whether it is polio, whether it is measles. Uh, I think Think, you know that just takes time to to deliver and and i don't think there's an easy solution but your point is very well taken uh now in one sense we have globally spent our way out of the problem of course in varying capacities right so india's uh, fiscal uh, stimulus package is way smaller than what we saw in you know europe and the us china's was surprisingly large uh, you know this is the first time we're seeing that kind of a monetization of debt and so on from the chinese side uh, but in one sense can we do this ever again? Or was this the one time get out of jail card and we have used it, right? So we don't know if this is the worst pandemic our generation is facing, but I imagine you can't keep spending your way out uh, every time this problem occurs, say in every two to three to five years, if there are new variants popping up. Well, um, I mean, I think we have to be what we can't, what, 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 I mean, I think we need to distinguish here. This is like very elementary, elementary in the sense of very fundamental economic questions that are being invoked here. And it's important to tread very carefully around them. What we clearly would be a disaster to have to do again would be to repeat the interruption of another generation of young people's education. I mean, that would be an absolute disaster to throw 25% of the Indian workforce into unemployment, even for a week, a day would be a disaster. We can't do that again. Losing 20% of global GDP, uh, which is what we saw at the beginning of April 2020, is a disaster we can't do again. Having 500,000 seafarers, you know, locked up in their vessels at sea is a tolerable situation that we can't repeat again. All of that, I agree, disastrous the financing and here i'm a sort of you know pure keynesian is a technicality right um the the the, the financing these are obligations which are broadly speaking held by one set of people that belong to society against another lot this is not money owed to martians this is money owed within society so really then it's a question of how we distribute the claims, the financial claims that arise from this, and if we need some sort of tax, which would be, as it were, a COVID tax that taxed those of us whose incomes did not fall during the crisis. In fact, some of us, like me, crisis is my brand. My income went up. My wife's in the travel sector collapsed. Right? I mean, she runs a she runs a small travel sector business. 
she had zero income. She was independent on benefits for the first time in her life. It's an extraordinary situation for her. And that entire network of people that she works with, breadless in, Cam in Cambodia, literally without enough, you know, with nothing to eat, with Venmoing money to them so that they can, you know, feed their kids. So, you know, that then just simply is a redistributional issue. You should tax me to pay them. That, that's the way you solve this, right? So <laughs> what we what we can't do is make her and all her colleagues unemployed again in a shock way. What we can do is settle the bill within the, the, the household economy. Like that's, now, we say we can do it. What, it. what it involves is politics, right? And that's really the question here. The question is not whether it's possible. The question is, can we manage the political fallout from dealing with this? And this is always the question after you've run up large bills like this. It's like, well, A, you can regret the meal that you've just bought and have indigestion or whatever from the huge beer meal. The real, the political question is who pays the check, right? So this is the, this is the distinction we have to make. There is no, there, there are loads of real social and economic reasons we should pray we never have to do a lockdown again. The question of debt is not one of those, but the question of debt poses the political problem. Are taxpayers willing to pay the interest and debt service? So then, and are they willing in due course to, as it were, re reallocate the income that's necessary to compensate people who in good faith have bought these assets, which are government debt on which they are owed repayment? Now. So that's the, the politics. And the question is, how quickly does that become binding? The, the beauty of our current situation is that we have interest rates which are negligible in the advanced economy world. That's where all of the really big debts were piled up. If you look at where, as it were, how the debt burden grew, it grew in the rich world overwhelmingly. In the rich world, it's not true for everyone, of course, emerging and low-income countries have quite significant interest payments. but they have small quantities of debt. The large quantity of debt is in the rich world. And as you know, I mean, the German government gets paid to take people's money as a piggy bank. It doesn't cost them anything in interest service. So that that's what we juggle. And the, and the reality of the world that we've been in really since the 1990s, and Japan is really, as it were, the lead elephant here, is that doesn't appear to be an upper limit to the quantity of public debt assets that you can hold on private balance sheets and public balance sheets, because that's part of where these gets end up. They end up in, say, the public pension fund. And they're really just a kind of almost redundant re-expression of the fact that, yes, you are owed a pension, and the form that your claim to a pension will take is, in a sense, repayment on this debt title that you're holding. It just reiterates that claim. And Japan is now at 220% of GDP, owed almost entirely to other Japanese within the Japanese political system, stabilized by the Bank of Japan. No, is it anyone's idea of like, you know, a simple structure? No, does it have potential political ramifications? Yes, but the choice is of course the alternatives. We certainly wouldn't want in an emergency situation in which, you know, my wife becomes unemployed and I go on earning money to say, well, we're not going to help you out because we can't settle the political issue right? or there's some upper limit to the amount that Adam can possibly be expected to transfer. When you say that, you're basically just saying there's a limit to our capacity to function as coherent polities and societies, because faced with a pandemic like this, we have to be able to make those transfers. I think there is an additional element to the politics of it. It's not just the politics of it, right? There are incentive effects when we start okay. Taxing yeah. certain groups uh, to redistribute, and now the the really terrible situation is you have this kind of economic contraction which is caused by variants in the future, and at the same time you start, you know, having a requirement to pay the past bills. So you got to tax someone in the middle of a contraction. Yeah. So the most productive people are going to face, in some sense, the the largest incentive or disincentive effects, right? Uh, yeah. So I don't think it's just a political problem. I do think there is there were companies that were incredibly productive, as you point out in the book during, uh, you know, the the shutdowns because we the world moved to Zoom and instead of doing this in Houston or Jaipur, we're yeah. doing this online right now. So there are companies that are booming and there are people. So now I know you are my favorite crisis econom, you know, economic historian. So you are not going to stop writing books in the middle of a crisis but were you to be taxed uh, a lot for this particular book uh, maybe you would be better off writing fewer books in the middle of a crisis so it is something to think about in terms of 
have we spent too much this time and the other part of course i mean i do see your point about this whole thing being complicated and in a sense a revolving you know sort of door of debt that needs to be managed within each country and society uh but uh at the same time the revolving door is uh, standing on the shoulders of the next generation right there's an expectation that future generations are going to honor these bills uh so i do think that there's something to be figured out aside from the politics of it we do need to think about not so much in the present and also in the future though i know you are a liberal keynesian so the long yeah. run is is less relevant uh, in, in your analysis Oh, I mean, I, I, love, I love debating with classical liberals. Um, I mean, your your train of reasoning is is impeccable. I mean, and 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 you're absolutely right that there are those kind of effects. That there, there are two sorts of uh, responses. I think first is, you know, the world is a tough place, and we have to make choices not between goods but between bads. And so, you know, what is what is the what is the choice here? And there there are disagreeable aspects to both choices. And then you know the way in which a liberal Keynesian spins this story, which is to say, well, were it to be the case that the private investment function feels muted after this, were it to be the case that animal spirits were dampened by this such that the business sector doesn't feel so frisky because all of a sudden tax rates have gone up, well, what would be the answer? The answer would be public investment, right? So, so which is why from the point of view of a classical liberal, you, 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 it's easy to see this as a sort of slippery slope to a fundamental rebalancing of the relationship between the public and the private sectors yeah. um, out of the, the force of your own logic. Um, and, you know, again, a liberal Keynesian might just shrug and say, you know, <laughs> bring it on. Um, uh, you're right. Uh, in this more complicated world, um, this more risky world in which there are these massive collective shocks that we will experience, it may very well be the case that relying as heavily as we have done in a society like the United States on the private investment function is simply anachronistic. It's not going to get us through. Or de facto, we make Amazon into a public utility, in which case, however, I want to regulate Amazon like a public utility um, and I want to tax Jeff Bezos's wealth, um, because de facto the government handed him a market, right? The lockdown effectively handed Jeff Bezos a market and we want to claw that back. So then we end up in a spiral. And of course that spiral has different histories and it has different resonances for different people. I've, I've, I've seen some of, you know, I've seen on your Twitter feed, your commemoration of the 1991 moment in India and the break out of Indian socialism. This has, you know, this is, I think a historic, it could be a historic turning point. Obviously left liberals, the progressive wing of American and, and European politics uh, explicitly embraces that as part of what may come out of this. And from the point of view of a classic liberal, you then see an entire morass of negative incentive structures opening up in front of us that may dampen growth, to which again, we might say, well, maybe growth shouldn't be the priority at the level of affluence that we currently enjoy. Why are we chasing growth? Why, why aren't we prioritizing issues of distribution, quality of life? Um, a genuine opportunity is well-being, um, given the environmental envelope, the very last thing we need to be doing uh, in the rich world with hugely excessive per capita consumptions of all resources and is increasing those. What we need, in fact, to be doing. This, isn't, this is not an aggressive degrowth strategy. It's just that if the consequence of this set of political positions were be to slow down our growth rate, I'd also just shrug and say, um, that's fine from my point of view, um, you know, and, and, you know, very mainline people like Jason Furman have made this point, you know, very proactively, which is from the point of view of the well-being of the average American, the growth of the last 50 years has been profoundly disappointing in the benefits that it's delivered. And a sensible policy should really be targeted at that median, really maybe even the 40% point at the distribution. And there's a whole range of things you can do with that, within that that do not require, as it were, the prioritization of the most rapid, you know, cutting edge growth at the limit with maximum incentives. So, but you're right. I mean, this opens up, this is why this is such a fascinating moment because it opens up this entire range of fundamental political, conceptual, differences and also visions of the future and the past, right, um, which, which come into play here. Absolutely. No. And, uh, you know, on the on the growth rate, I think once again, all the fault lines you point out in your book, uh, once again, this plays into the rest of the world, right? There is a small number of people living in very rich countries which can 
afford to stagnate in one sense, right? They've, they've earned the privilege of this kind of stagnation for a few years uh, to work their way out of this problem. Whereas very large parts of the world, you know, three, three and a half billion people live in countries where they simply cannot compromise rates of growth because that's the only ticket out uh, to the next stage of growth, you know, where they can also enjoy privileges uh, like the Americans and the Europeans and yeah. so on. I would say there's two positions as complementary. If you, yeah. if you take the climate, climate envelope as a given, yes. then the sooner the rich countries that already enjoy, what by any standard, you know, that there's really no material constraint on the realization of all of basic human needs. However, there's no philosophy which has ever defined a need that cannot be satisfied at the average level of GDP of the rich West. Freeze, it creates space for yeah. the a a completely imperative growth. I mean, I, I, you know, as this th thing hit, I was traveling courtesy of my wife's business in Tanzania and, and Tanzania has a, sh a shocking need for, you know, rapidly accelerating growth. They, they, they need to at least quadruple GDP, uh, GDP per capita and probably more, more dramatically increase energy consumption there. And, and the question, of course, is how we do it uh, sustainably such that it doesn't, as it were, create circumstances which through climatic effects will make life even more difficult for people in those kind of precarious situations. So I see these positions as very completely complementary. The, the, the degrowth agenda for anyone other than the rich countries of the world is, is utterly irresponsible and indefensible. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's, a, it's a, to my mind, just an absurdity. It's also utterly unrealistic to go with your yes. liberalism. It's like you underestimate those people if you think this is some kind of choice that we get to make. I mean, they're coming, like, whether, whether, whether we find it comfortable or not. And, and, you know, Godspeed to to that human energy and the the entrepreneurship and initiative and um, of 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 the majority of humanity. Let's face it. Yeah, there, this has been fascinating. I think we're almost out of time. Uh, there are. I just want to, for the audience, point out that there are so many aspects of the book that we did not get into. Uh, there's a really important idea of. Uh, China and how China looks at what China will be like, you know, in the future based on what we've seen uh, in the last uh, 18 months in the book. Uh, there is a lot of detail on how each country has dealt with these problems and the sort of uh, financial incentives that were put in place, how the global financial community has lobbied. Uh, so the book actually goes far beyond the conversation we've had. Uh, we're almost out of time. Thank you so much, Adam, uh, for this very, very fascinating conversation. A real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And thank you, Shruti, for sharing your insights into the havoc that COVID-19 has created and how it has wrecked the world's economy. Thank you all for watching and being a great audience. We encourage you to buy the books for speakers that are available through the Brazos bookstore. And if you like the session, do consider supporting us through the support JLF option button on the right hand side of your screen. We sincerely value your contributions. We gratefully thank all our JLF Houston advisors, donors and partners for generously supporting the festival. We hope you all enjoyed this conversation and will tune in for our next session. Black Wave, Kim Ghatas, in conversation with Seema Sirohi. This will be at 11 a.m. Central Time, which is 9 a.m. Pacific Time, 10 a.m. Mountain Time, and 12 p.m. Eastern Time. It's also 9.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time. We now present a reading from the GLF Writer short series. Everyone. I'm Asha Gaur, a student of class 11 of Vassan Valley School in New Delhi. I discovered my passion for writing at a very early age. And being an introvert, I found it the best way to express myself to the world, which otherwise I found very difficult. At the age of 13, I had some mental health issues and I found that writing was the most therapeutic way to help me battle through my struggles. Since then, I've written consistently for platforms such as India Today's Daily O, Youth Ki Awaaz, and I also have my own blog called www.phoenixfantasies.wordpress.com. Recently, I published my own book called How to Open a Parachute, which is about my journey with mental health as a teenager. I believe that 
people from all walks of life can relate to this book because because it provides hope to everyone who's going through a struggle of their own and I'm, and on that note i shall now recite a poem from this book called on a ventilator For long I suffered abuse and treason from whom you may ask it is but you I gave you gifts of knowledge and compassion but alas they've been treated in an unmerciful fashion you ponder over the reason for my rage calling my teachings a reign of terror but like a mother I am your creator sometimes an enemy other times a sparer when you are human i bless thee i nurture your heart but when you are a demon you must deal with life falling apart my lessons encompass the elements of pain they are thus acquainted with suffering despair and mostly pain it is this that i shall teach you the principles that you have so easily disregarded those stepping stones of life that you have shunned and discarded why is it easier for you to hate when its contrary was made more natural to you why is greed your habit when this world was made for more than just a few how does heaven perpetuate a desire for you to live in hell when earth was the only heaven made in this universe it is simple my child ultimately you must ask yourself a question and you shall find the cause for your punishment ask yourself what makes me human thank you <laughs>so in that sense i want to democratize the the the, the story of innovation I'm, i want to make it clear that anyone can do it the basic question that a writer asked i think is what should i write about and um, mm-hmm. you know it, it's, it, that's the biggest question you know there's no help for you either uh, and it's, it's a total mystery but what is common throughout history throughout time is that when you have that upstairs downstairs thing There's a certain amount of that that you can maintain if you're on top through hard power and hard system. We're absolutely delighted to be back here with our edition, albeit digitally, of JLF Houston. There are so many wonderful authors and speakers who you will hear over the next few days. And I hope they will power your imagination as they have ours to look into the future into a brighter tomorrow.